Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, from today onwards, we are starting a very new series and this series is on spectroscopy. Friends, this is an introductory lecture where we are going to give you in-depth knowledge on what spectroscopy is. Friends, for the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios, Professor Sanjeev Kumar. Dear friends, Professor Sanjeev Kumar is a renowned professor of uh, chemistry and uh, he is uh, associated with the School of Sciences, Indira Gandhi National Open University. Friends, uh, we believe that uh, for today's topic, he is the most appropriate person to talk on. Friends, if you feel so that uh, you have lots of questions in mind regarding uh, this particular topic that is spectroscopy, then you are uh, free to talk to us, to ask questions on the topic from Professor Sanjeev Kumar. For contacting us, kindly note down our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. All dear friends are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture only, as well as you are requested to ask questions relevant to the topic only. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Professor Sanjeev Kumar, and would request him to explain us in detail what spectroscopy is, as I have already told you that this is an introductory lecture. Hello, sir. Welcome mm -hmm. to the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Hello, friends. Uh, in today's session, I intend to talk about the basic aspects of spectroscopy, and I'm sure that uh, you may be aware of that spectroscopy basically is an analytical tool. Uh, that uses the interaction of radiation and matter. Essentially, uh, as I want to really define it, spectroscopy to be a study of interaction of radiation, that is electromagnetic radiation and matter. And this actually is a very, very versatile tool and it is used for wide variety of things. For example, uh, we talk about spectroscopy to be used primarily for structural elucidation of organic and inorganic species. That is one of the most important applications of spectroscopy. Another one is about quantification of substances. That is another domain where spectroscopy comes into play. Yet another one is about study of interaction between different types of species. Now suppose I have a protein molecule and I want to see how does it interact with a given metal ion for that matter or the interaction between proteins and nucleic acids. So all these kind of interactions between different kind of species can be studied with the help of spectroscopy. Yet another domain happens to be medical diagnostics. We all go for diagnostic purposes to medical uh, laboratories and all. There are a lot of blood tests we do or other tests are done there. Most of these tests uh, depend on spectroscopy as a part of their uh, assessment process there. Uh, that MRI you are familiar with, that also is basically a spectroscopic application of spectroscopy over there. Okay. So what we see from here is that is the spectroscopy happens to be the study of interaction of electromagnetic radiation and matter. If that be so, then the question comes up is how do I study this? How do I talk about that? That exactly uh, is the way I am going to take up this session today. And the session is planned as follows. That is, we will start by talking about what is electromagnetic radiation and what are its characteristics. Thereafter, we will come down to the quantum mechanical nature of atoms and molecules. You remember that I just defined spectroscopy to be interaction of radiation and matter. So to understand that, we need to first understand what is radiation, that is what is electromagnetic radiation, what are the characteristics over there, then we come down to the nature of matter. That is the matter's nature we talk about in the context of atoms and molecules. That is what is the quantum mechanical description of atoms and molecules. Having done that, we will move on further and see that how the two can interact because I am repeatedly telling you that spectroscopy is interaction of radiation and matter. So we need to understand what is radiation, what is matter and how the two interact. Thereafter, I have talked about different modes of interactions possible there. We will move on to that what are the prerequisites for such an interaction to take place. Then we will proceed to uh, the types of spectra which comes up because essentially what happens is the radiation and matter, the two interact and that interaction leads to generation of a spectra. So depending on what kind of interaction we are having, accordingly there will be different types of spectra will be there. So we will learn about what are different types of spectra. Then we will see that what are different characteristics of a spectrum. We will take up some example here and then try to describe what are different characteristics of a given spectra and what is the significance there. Then we will move on to, uh, because to 
spectrum is fine. That is, there is an interaction leading to a spectrum there. But how do I get a spectrum? For that, we need some kind of an instrument there. I will talk basically very little about the basic aspects of the absorption instruments over there, just as an example over there. And towards the end, we will try to sum up what we do in today's session. Okay. So, with this as an outline, let us make a beginning uh, by talking about the nature of electromagnetic radiation. I am sure that you have learnt about electromagnetic radiation in your earlier classes there. We all know that electromagnetic radiation is nothing but is a form of energy and that energy is transmitted through space at very large velocities and we know that the velocity of radiation or electromagnetic radiation we know as light for the matter has to be about 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second that is a very enormously large velocity there. And second aspect of EM radiation is that is it does not require a medium to, for transmission. That means the EM radiations can transmit without a medium also, but it does uh, transmit even in a medium. Because right now I am speaking in a medium and my, this transmission is reaching to you, it is some kind of a radiations are reaching to you. Okay? So, medium is fine, but even without medium electromagnetic radiations can move through. Okay. Now, if this be so, then let us try to see that electromagnetic radiation basically has got two kinds of descriptions. One is typical what is called as a classical or wave description and second happens to be some kind of a quantum mechanical or particle description. I will describe both of them to you. First one first. That is as regards the wave description, electromagnetic radiation can be visualized as oscillatory electrical and magnetic fields that travel in planes perpendicular to each other and also to the direction of propagation. Let us understand this. What basically you have is, we have a electromagnetic disturbance. So, there is a disturbance, electrical disturbance going in one dimension there, there is a magnetic disturbance perpendicular to that and these two are perpendicular to each other as well as perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Let us understand with the help of this diagram here. You see that we find that there are two kinds of oscillatory field shown over there. The one vertical one here is depicting the electrical field over there, okay, which is oscillating. Then perpendicular to that, we have a magnetic field which is shown in red over here. Do you see that these two fields, the electrical field and the magnetic field, both are mutually perpendicular. And also, this radiation is moving actually in this direction, that is the direction of propagation. So, there are three things now. These are the three things. This, the finger here is indicating uh, the direction of propagation of radiation. The thumb here is giving me the direction of propagation of electrical field. And this gives me, this uh, middle finger here gives me the variation of magnetic field. So, the three things are mutually perpendicular to each other. So, that is very typical way of looking at electromagnetic radiation. Fine. Okay. So, now we know, we know what is electromagnetic radiation. Then, how do we characterize it? The certain characteristics we need to understand because as I mentioned earlier, I am going to talk about very basic aspects of spectroscopy. So, and these things we will be using off and on when we talk about spectroscopy. So, we have to be very clear about it. And as regards the characteristics of EM radiation go, let us take up some of them. The first one happens to be amplitude. Amplitude basically is defined as, uh, you know that there is a wave moving like this. So, in a wave, what do we have? Uh, wave essentially there are crests there, there are troughs over here. Okay? So, the height of crest or depth of the trough, both are taken to be amplitude there. And essentially, amplitude of a wave is a measure of the radiant power and the intensity of the wave. Let us take an example here. I am sure that you have seen uh, the waves on the seashore. Now, suppose you are standing on a seashore, a small wave comes it is a small ripple is coming there uh, that strikes your feet and then you enjoy that little feeling of that. But because it is a very, very mild uh, wave which is coming to you. But suppose as against that you have a very large intense wave coming there with high amplitude that has lot of power, lot of intensity is there that actually can knock you off from the field. Okay? So, th that is the meaning of when you say amplitude, amplitude refers to how high is the wave or how high or how low is the wave over there. So, that is the meaning of amplitude and that actually is a measure of the intensity of the wave. Okay? The next statistic we can talk about is the wavelength. As the name suggests, wavelength refers to the length of the wave. Essentially, that is a linear distance between two consecutive wave crests or wave troughs. Let us look at this. 
So, this is a schematic representation of a wave. Now, these are the crests over here and these two are the troughs here. So, the distance between these two, this is the wavelength here. So, wave starts from over here, comes down like this, comes like this, comes like this and goes over here. Okay. So, that is one wave or we can visualize it, the distance between the two troughs there or maybe even you can think of these two distances here. All these three are equivalent here. Each one of them represents a wavelength, length of a wave. You can start anywhere on the wave and move one uh, wavelength and come to the same point over there in the same dimension. So, that is the wavelength. Typically, the wavelengths are represented by lambda. You must have learned about that in your uh, earlier classes there. And the dimensions of wavelength happen to be as an, it is, it is a length. So, dimensions are that of length. The SI unit for it happens to be meter. And if you look at, typically, the commonly used units are angstrom, which is now it is getting a little more, uh, little of obsolete now. And then it is nanometer or micrometer. Most oftenly used happens to be the nanometer there. A nanometer actually is equal to 1 into 10 to the power minus 9 meters. Okay. So, that is about wavelength. And if you go further, yet another characteristic of a uh, wave or EM radiation happens to be wave number. As the name suggests, wave number is number of waves per unit distance. Now, suppose I have certain distance, say, marked from here to here. Okay. So, and if you look at it here, so there are about 1, 2, 3 and a half. There are 3 and a half waves in distance. So, the wave number happens to be 3. It is an arbitrary example I am taking here. It happens to be 3.5. Now, suppose I take this. I have the same distance again, but we find that there are number of waves is 9 here in this case. That means, if I take wavelength to be smaller, there will be more waves which will come in the same distance over there. So, wave number is the number of waves per unit distance. In a given dis unit distance, how many waves are there? Okay. So, and uh, it is very obvious from here that is if the wavelength happens to be less, the wave number will be more. That is, there is a inverse relationship between wavelength and wave number. And that is what we typically show over here. Wave number is depicted as nu bar. That is the symbol for wave number and that happens to be equal to 1 by lambda. Since lambda was my wavelength, it had the dimensions of me, uh, length or the unit was meter. So, units of wave number will be meter inverse. The meter inverse is, uh, is not used very often. More often used is the uh, centimeter inverse. That is a commonly used unit for wave number there. So, so, we know about what is the amplitude of a wave. We also know about what is the wavelength. We also know what is wave number. Let us move further and take up the next characteristic and that happens to be the frequency frequency, how frequent. Okay. So, this basically can be defined as the number of wave crests or wave troughs or number of waves for that matter which pass through a given point per second that, that happens to be the unit of time here. What it means is, uh, suppose uh, I have, uh, so, say this happens to be the distance with the wave travels in one second and if I look at this point is my point of reference and as this wave is moving, you will find that as this moves through, there will be about four crests or four truss or rather for the matter, four waves will be passing through this point here. So, that happens to be the frequency. Okay. Similarly, if I take yet another wave here, so we find that since this has a lower wavelength, the more of such waves will be able to pass through the same, uh, uh, through the same point in the same amount of time, that is per second. Okay. So, frequency again is inversely related to the wavelength here. So, we have relationship as frequency is given a symbol as nu, that is a Greek letter here, uh, c is the velocity of light and lambda happens to be the wavelength here. And the units for this happens to be, as you said, it is number of number, number of waves per unit time. So, essentially uh, the SI unit will be time inverse and uh, that happens to be per second. And to honor uh, hertz, a scientist here. So, this has been given a special name as hertz. So, 1 hertz is nothing but 1 second inverse. Okay? So, that is unit of frequency. If we move further, there is yet another characteristic of a electromagnetic radiation that happens to be velocity. Velocity is the linear distance traveled by wave in 1 second. How much of distance does it travel in unit time? That is 1 second. And velocity can be found by multiplying the frequency and the wavelength. And that happens to be 
nu in second inverse and lambda in meter. So, essentially the units will come down to be meters per second. So, that is a typical way of representing any velocity for that matter. Velocity is distance per unit time. Okay. And then lastly, there is one more a very important thing because every wave has as we said we defined AM radiation to be uh, some kind of transfer of energy, transmission of energy. So, what is the energy of that? That energy of EM radiation actually is found to be proportional to the frequency or inversely related to the wavelength and wave number. And this relationship that is E is equal to H nu is equal to H c by lambda or is equal to H c nu bar is very, very crucial. You will be needing this relationship any time you talk about any kind of spectroscopy because there is a very fundamental relationship here that is E is equal to H nu that is where the nu happens to be the frequency or is equal to h c by lambda, c is the uh, velocity of light and lambda happens to be the wavelength or h c nu bar where nu bar happens to be the wave number. So, we can see that how are the three related to each other. We can even this relationship tells you the relationship between uh, different characteristics of my EM radiation there. Okay. Let us go further. Uh, we, we, I mentioned earlier that there are two kinds of descriptions we have for EM radiation. What we discussed so far is about the wave description of that. If it is a wave, how, how do we characterize that? The second description happens to be the particle description. According to that, uh, the wave as you may define that EM radiation is something which carries uh, transfer of energy is there. So, this radiant energy which is carried by the wave is considered as a stream of particles there. That means, one description is we have a wave. Second description is it is a stream of particles there. That means, there are certain particles called as photons, they are the ones which carry energy over there. That is a particle description or a quantum mechanical description there. And then each packet of energy is actually called as quanta. And earlier when it was this term actually came up there, so uh, the light quanta, that means the, uh, the, the quanta or the quantum, quantum is singular there, the quanta, uh, the quanta of visible light, they were actually called as photons to begin with. Nowadays, all quanta, I mean all radiations quantum are called as photons there. It has become a uh, general term now. Earlier it was used only for the visible light there. Okay. Th that is as regards our description of electromagnetic radiation there. Okay. Now, essentially what you see is that energy of a photon is proportional to the frequency and the wave number because H c nu bar and is inversely related to the wavelength over there. Okay. So, that is as regards our uh, description of electromagnetic radiation. And then let us take up a small problem on this. Suppose I have a radiation which is corresponding to green light, that is what we see, and that has a wavelength about 535 nanometers. If I am required to calculate the energy of a photon of green light, how do I go about it? It is very, very straightforward and simple application of what we have learned just now. And what we see is we know that E is equal to H nu or is equal to H c by lambda. And if we have this, we know that H happens to be 6.626 into 34 joule second velocity of light we know of that is C. We also know the lambda which is given to us. We just substitute that into the formula and what you get is energy happens to be equal to 3.72 into 4 minus 19 joules. It is very, very simple and straightforward uh, application of the formulas what we just learnt. Okay. Having talked about electromagnetic radiation, let us move further and try to understand one more thing uh, that is electromagnetic spectrum. That's this term again you will be coming across very often, so we need to understand this. Electromagnetic spectrum, spectrum typically is a dispersion or a spread. Okay. So, when you talk about electromagnetic spectrum, essentially I am talking about the spread of all possible types of electromagnetic radiation we have. And we find that uh, this spectrum spreads from, starts from somewhere from gamma rays to radio waves. Gamma rays is this end of the spectrum and radio waves are the opposite end of it. And we find is that these different radiations are arranged in terms of their wavelengths and or the frequencies. Wave, frequencies are increasing like this, wavelengths are increasing like this. You can see that this is a very short wavelength. As you move further, the wavelength is increasing there. That means, the radio waves have got very high wavelength whereas gamma rays have got a very low wavelength over there. Okay. And we also know and that inverse will be true of the frequency, the two are going opposite to each other. What it means is that the radio waves 
having a very low frequency will have low energy whereas gamma rays of a very high frequency will have a very high energy there and second thing which you need to take note of here is that is uh, this small bit here which are expanded over here that is the visible part of it the visible spectrum which you are familiar with actually that forms a very tiny part of the whole electromagnetic spectrum there and then one more thing probably you can take note of here is that if you look at here uh, this is the visible part you are familiar with that's vibgeor violet indigo red blue green and so on and so forth this is the red end of it this is the blue end of it or the violet end of it what you find is that if you look at here this is ir infrared beyond red on this side and this is ultraviolet the, the second part of it so we will be talking about all these things ultraviolet spectroscopy or ir spectroscopy all this will be taking up as we proceed further so you need to take note of it here that is the visible happens to be very tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum more about it when we talk about spectroscopy individually there okay now uh, let's try to move further to the next aspect of the understanding of uh, electromag uh, that is spectroscopy we have understood about the nature of radiation let's move on to the nature of matter here and about nature of matter basically uh, all matter has quantization there so if you look at the uh, description of atoms essentially the electronic energy of atoms are quantized there that there different quantum energy levels are there you have learned about that in your earlier classes the bohr's model of atom i'll skip this part this is very trivial but what's important is when we come down to molecules what do we have in case of molecules besides electronic energies even the vibrational and rotational energies are quantized and this uh, leads to something of this kind of a description here that is we have got electronic energies of molecules which are quantized there there are different energy levels held which basically we learned in earlier classes also on from molecular orbital theory so there are the electronic energy levels of the molecules there what you find is that when a molecule has happens to be in a given energy electronic energy level its vibration energy levels are also quantized over there so it means in a given electronic energy level there are different vibration energy levels over there and similarly for this level there are again different vibration energy levels there okay if you move further even you go further down here you find that for a given vibration energy level there are rotation energy levels which are quantized there and what you can see it here that is the electronic energy levels are far apart whereas vibration energy level are relatively closer and rotational energy levels are still close by okay and if you put the three things together we get some kind of a Uh, energy level diagrams which looks like this what do we have here this set of energy levels are the electronic energy levels which is in the ground state here that is e not level there these are the excited energy levels over there which are electronically excited energy levels there and secondly what we see is that in this this, this diagram is very very important here that is within this electronic energy level there are different vibration energy levels here, which are given as v1 2 3 and so on and so forth and within a vibration energy level there are rotation energy level which are given in terms of j over there so what you find is this is a comprehensive picture of energy level diagram for a molecule there okay now essentially if you one more thing we can take note of it here is as i mentioned earlier too that is the rotation energies are very small it's about 1 to 2 cm inverse whereas vibration energy levels are about 1000 times 10 to the power 3 times larger 1000 2000 3000 and so on and so forth whereas electronic energy levels are even 1000 times higher than that that is tends to be 6 or so so this is about 1 to 2 or 0 to 10 this is about 1000 this is about tends to be 6 okay so that is the kind of relationship we have between different kind of energy levels over there and when we try to see that when the radiation comes and interacts with matter so what happens here what happens is that there could be transitions between these levels there that will give me microwave spectroscopy and between vibration energy levels will give me ir spectroscopy between electronic energy levels will give me the uh, energy levels which will give me uh, ultraviolet or visible spectrum uh, over there okay now when the radiation and matter interact what can happen uh, before we continue with this let's try to see where are we we started by defining Uh, what is called as spectroscopy to be interaction of radiation 
and matter okay having done that we came down to understanding what is electromagnetic radiation we talked about what is radiation we talked about the characteristics of that then we talked about the nature of matter okay so having done this uh, now we can move further we will do it after the break that is we will talk about what is radiation and matters ways of interaction what are the different possibilities there how the two can interact and what happens as a consequence of that with this no thank you so thank you so very much for giving us uh, uh, this session uh, friends uh, you are requested to be with us as a uh, professor sanjeev kumar himself said that we are going to discuss some more so be with us we are back after a short break thank you Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are uh, talking on spectroscopy. This is the first session, first lecture in the series and uh, we are trying to give you more and more information on what spectroscopy is. Friends, in the previous session we left you with the question what happens when uh, uh, matter and radiation interact and uh, we are going to continue further from this point where we left uh, in the previous uh, uh, session. Friends, for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Professor Sanjeev Kumar. Professor Sanjeev Kumar is 
Ali is the renowned professor of uh, chemistry and uh, through him we are getting in-depth knowledge on the topic. So friends, let's welcome our guest Professor Sanjeev Kumar and before that we would like to tell you all that if you have any questions pertaining to the topic then do call us through our toll free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat our number is 1-800-110-430. Now I would like to welcome our guest Professor Sanjeev Kumar once again. Hello sir. Thank Thank you. Thank you again, ma'am. Okay, uh, dear friends, remember that we were talking about spectroscopy and we define spectroscopy to be the study of interaction of radiation and matter. And in the previous session, we learnt about what is radiation, the nature of radiation in terms of the wave description and particle description. And then after we talked about the description of uh, a matter that is atoms and molecules. Now, let us go further and raise a question what happens, what are different ways in which the radiation and matter can interact. And if that be so, we find that there are three different possibilities. And the possibilities happen to be, that is, there could be absorption of radiation, that is, the matter absorbs the radiation. Second happens to be emission of radiation, that is, the matter gives out radiation. And the third possibility is, this is some kind of a scattering of radiation. Let us understand each of these uh, three possibilities there. The first one first, that is absorption. In case of absorption, what basically happens is to begin with our system, that is be it atom or a molecule, that happens to be in a lower energy. Say energy happens to be E1, just a representative value here. And when a photon comes, photon having energy of H nu, where nu happens to be the frequency of that. When the two it interacts, what can happen is the system goes from a level E1 to E2, and that this that H nu has energy equal to this difference that is delta E, delta E happens to be E2 minus E1. That means when I have energy of E1 for the given system, the photon comes with the energy equal to delta E, the system goes to level E2. There is an absorption of energy and then there is an, this is called, this process is called as excitation or absorption. Okay. Now, in case of atoms, what basically happens is uh, that when the photon comes, the system can go from a given electronic energy level to higher electronic energy level. This is called as a electronic excitation. That is, in case of atoms, there is only one possibility, that is, there is a electronic excitation because only electronic energies are quantized in case of atoms. But when you come to molecules, there are, uh, and then this actually forms a basis for our atomic absorption spectroscopy. We will come to that at a later stage. Okay. Now, when you move to molecules, what you find is there are different possibilities. You remember that in the previous session, we talked about that different kind of quantizations in molecules, quantization of electronic energy, quantization of vibration energy, quantization of rotational energy. So, accordingly, what we can have is that is there could be rotational transition. That means, the system happens to be in a lower rotational energy level, photon comes and the system goes to higher level there. So, do you have what is called as a rotational transitions and this gives me a basis for our microwave spectroscopy. Second possibility could be there could be vibrational transitions. When the system goes from a lower vibration energy level to higher vibration energy level, that gives me vibrational transitions or vibration spectroscopy or for that matter IR or infrared spectroscopy there. Another possibility is that in case of molecules continuing further, we find that there could be electronic transitions which are accompanied by vibrational and rotational transitions. Let us understand this. Say we have this transition. What does it mean is that the system to begin with is in a level E naught, that is electronic ground state. And within electronic ground state, it is in the level V1 here, V0 here. From here, this goes over here. That means there is a electronic excitation. We go from E0 to E1. There is a vibrational excitation also and there is also a rotational excitation. That is typical in case of molecules there. That means, if I give sufficient energy and that energy happens to be in the range of ultraviolet and the visible range there. We will talk about this spectroscopy in much details at a later stage. For right now, what we see is that this kind of a transition leads to that forms the basis for our UV visible spectroscopy there. Okay. Now, in some cases, what basically happens is, uh, because we talked about the energy levels which are quantized on their own, but in certain cases, uh, there are two possibilities there. What happens is, system to begin with does not have quantized energy levels there. That means, suppose we have got uh, the nuclei of certain atoms, 
we will talk about that in later stage just for right now there could be uh, unpaired electrons or nuclear certain uh, kind of atoms like proton or carbon 13 they are randomly oriented there but if i apply magnetic field we find that this can orient in two possible ways either they are aligned with the field or against the field and that actually generates two energy levels there it means to begin with the system is degenerate energies are same but in the presence of magnetic field we find that the two energy levels can come there and if i give a radio frequency there can be a transition there that means i can obtain spectrum if and only if there is magnetic field in the absence of magnetic field this kind of spectrum cannot be observed that means the interaction of radiation matter cannot lead to a spectrum there and this forms the basis for our nmr and esr spectroscopy we will talk about all these in much more detail at a later stage as i mentioned earlier today i'm just going to give you an overview of the basic aspects of what spectroscopy is all about okay let's move further and see what we've done is we have the system at a lower energy level we're given some energy because of interaction system has gone to higher energy level what happens to that when the system has got excited it actually typically relaxes down by giving energy to the surroundings in terms of heat i mean suppose you have a molecule which is at higher energy level given by this stress over there when it comes down to ground state the extra energy which had gained that gives out in the form of heat that's a typical observation what we have and such kind of relaxation is actually called as non radiative relaxation there's no radiation involved in this system had got excited by absorbing radiation there but now after that what happens as a consequence of it it just relaxes down on its own okay that is one possibility another possibility is uh, uh, this is a very quick phenomenon 10 to minus 6 to minus 9 seconds it takes place another possibility is that there can be an emission of radiation that means the system to begin with was a lower energy level i give energy to that by radiation system has gone to higher energy level from higher energy level system can a system i am referring to basically are atoms or molecules they can come down to ground state by giving out a photon this is called as a radiative relaxation or also called as emission there so there's a second possibility one possibility was because of interaction of radiation matter there can be absorption of radiation in this case what you are saying is the second possibility that is there is a emission of radiation from a system in the excited state there okay now in atoms what we have is there can be electronic emission there that means we have system at higher energy level to begin with this comes down to lower energy level gives out a photon that's a emission in case of atoms there in case of and this actually forms the basis for our atomic emission spectroscopy we will talk about all spectroscopies one by one as we proceed now in case of molecules the system is little more complicated a little more involved over there what you find is there can be non radiative deactivation which is preceding the emission of photon there let's understand this say to begin with i have this happening here this is essentially as we mentioned earlier also this absorption of radiation system has gone from lower energy level to higher energy level this is excitation there now this system at higher energy level can come down in two possible ways but right now we are referring to situation where there can be a radiative emission there so what we see is in some cases what happens that this is what happens here okay have you able to notice this let let me go back again what we had is we had system which has been excited there then given some time this system can relax down what we see is okay so what we noticed here is system was in this level there it is electronically vibrationally as well as rotationally excited there but it this collides with the surrounding molecules gives out energy comes down it is a kind of something like vibration or relaxation takes place there it comes down to lower energy level and then from this level when it comes down it gives a photon the radiation emission is happening over here so this is the meaning of when i say the deactivation is non radiative to begin with part of it and then there after this a radiative emission this actually is a very important phenomenon that forms the basis for our fluorescence and phosphorescence spectroscopies again we will take up at a later stage okay let's move further and talk about two more related phenomenon i'm sure that we learned about uh, heard about what's called as chemiluminescence and bioluminescence chemiluminescence as the name suggests is chemiluminescence luminescence is glowing okay 
So what we can have is there can be certain re chemical reactions in which the energy is generated and that energy the system goes to higher energy level and comes down to lower energy level by giving out a photon. This again is a radiative emission there that is a very important phenomenon. And then second one is bioluminescence, bio means biological system there. We can see a firefly typically uh, in Hindi we call it as jugnu. So uh, this gives out radiation there, the light here, that light again is coming because of uh, because of certain biological reactions, the molecules are in the higher energy level. When they come down to lower energy level, they give out radiation there. So this phenomenon is called as a bioluminescence, and the earlier one was chemiluminescence. They are also related phenomena. Okay, let's go further and see the third possibility. We have talked about where the two radiation and matter are interacting. There could be absorption. There could be emission. The third possibility is there could be scattering of radiation. Let's understand this. So what basically happens is you have this is a sample of matter here. Radiation is coming here that interacts with this. There could be possibility that some kind of a reflection is there or light some the light gets transmitted. Part of it gets scattered, scattered all around. Scattering basically uh, is something, uh, suppose you see there is a dark room and the small light is coming there. You can see dust particles moving around there. The dust particles we see because of scattering of radiation there. Okay. So this scattering actually is observed typically in a direction perpendicular to the direction of propagation of light here. So what you do is put a filter there and see what kind of radiations are getting scattered over there. And typically in case of a scattering, uh, the scattered radiation has different kind of frequencies there. There are two main kinds there. One, most of it happens to be having the frequency same as that of the incident frequency. That means you have a sample here, radiation is coming of certain frequency, it interacts there and what comes out as a scattered light has the same frequency. That is called as Rayleigh scattering. That is most of it happens to be of the same frequency there. But there are small fraction of the scattered radiation which has frequencies lower or higher than the incident radiation and this is what forms the basis for our Raman spectroscopy. That is what exactly was the contribution of Raman who got a Nobel Prize for that in 1930. Okay. Okay. So if all this be so, we we'll come to the next question that means we have talked about radiation, we talked about matter, we talked about their interaction. The question comes up is does it so happen that all kind of radiations will interact with all kind of matter there or something more is there? The answer to that is, it's not so that all radiation will interact with all kind of matter, because what we need is for the interaction of radiation and matter to occur, we need some kind of a mechanism there. Or in other words, we say there are certain conditions which have to be met for this interaction to happen, and these conditions are called as prerequisites. Okay, so for any interaction of radiation and matter to occur, certain prerequisites are required or necessary conditions are required. And let us understand what are these prerequisites with the help of two or three examples here. Now if I want to talk about say if I want to observe rotational spectrum, rotation spectrum essentially is molecules rotating and the rotational energy is quantized there. If microwave radiations come that interact with the matter and there can be a spectrum there. But for that interaction to occur, the prerequisite for that is that is the molecule must possess a permanent dipole moment. If the molecule does not have permanent dipole moment, the interaction will not take place, I will not be able to observe the rotational spectrum. Let us understand why of it. Now if I look at these two molecules here, this is a simple model for our hydrogen molecule. The two hydrogen atoms are bonded by a bond, a chemical bond here. Now if I look at HCl, this is a hydrogen atom there, this is a chlorine atom there. So there is a because of the difference in electronegativity, there is a small negative charge on this and small positive charge on uh, hydrogen atom there. So this is a polar molecule, this is a non-polar molecule. This has a dipole moment, this does not have a dipole moment. So this molecule will not give a rotation spectrum whereas this will give. Let us understand why of it. What basically happens is a molecule like HCl which is polar has a dipole moment. When it tumbles, when it rotates, you can see that when it is in this orientation, this is the dipole moment here. When it moves like this, say moving it clockwise, when it is moving, so when it moves here, we find that the dipole moment is changing. So with the rotation, we are generating an oscillatory dipole moment there. So there is an oscillation here. 
Okay. So this oscillatory dipole moment and our radiation, which also is an oscillatory electrical field over there, the two can interact. There's a mechanism available now. So in case of hydrogen HCl molecule, this is a possibility that the two can interact, and we do get a rotational spectrum for HCl. Whereas if you talk about hydrogen molecule, then it is totally a non-polar molecule. If it tumbles, it rotates. There is no dipole moment generation there, so there is no interaction, so there is no spectrum there. So it is important here to understand that for rotation spectrum to be observed, the molecule must possess a permanent dipole moment, that is one requirement here. Now let us take second example here. In case of IR spectrum, the requirement is that the molecular vibration must be associated with an oscillatory dipole, oscillating dipole. Let us take two examples here. Look at this one, this is carbon dioxide symmetric stretching mode. We will come to, we will talk about in detail at a later stage. For right now, we know that carbon dioxide molecule is a linear molecule there. We have a carbon atom here. So, there are two oxygens here and since it is a symmetrical molecule there, so this carbon and this is one dipole moment here, this is another dipole moment, the two are in opposite direction and the net dipole moment happens to be 0. And if I look at the symmetric stretching mode of this, let us understand what is the meaning of symmetric stretch here. What do we have? So there is one carbon atom here in the center there. So there are two oxygen atoms like this. So we can imagine this carbon over here. Okay. In case of symmetric stretching, what do we have? What do we have is we have carbon here, one oxygen, second oxygen. And this is one carbon oxygen bond, this is second carbon oxygen bond. So this oxygen is moving like this. Okay. That is the meaning of symmetric stretching. This is my equilibrium position this bond is expanding, both the bonds are expanding simultaneously, coming back to normalcy, contracting now and so on and so forth. So in this kind of a vibrational mode, what you find is that at no stage there will be any dipole moment there because the two are doing at the same frequency, so there will be net dipole moment to be 0. That means this mode of vibration of carbon dioxide does not show IR activity. That means this mode will not be observed in the IR spectrum. On the other hand, if I look at asymmetric stretching mode, asymmetric stretching mode is that this carbon oxygen bond, this carbon oxygen bond, this bond is expanding and when this is contracting here. So this has a shorter dipole moment, this has a larger one there. When the two move like this, there will be a net dipole moment which will be coming every time. And as a consequence, this mode of vibration is IR active and it will be observed in the IR spectrum there. So that is the meaning, this is carbon here, two oxygens there. So what is happening is this is expanding, this is contracting. So that is how it moves. Carbon is in the center, please imagine that one. So I repeat, this is I am talking about. This is the asymmetric mode of vibration of carbon side and this will be observed in IR spectrum there. This is IR active. Okay. Let us move further and take up say for Raman spectrum to be observed. The prerequisite happens to be the molecule must be anisotropically polarizable. What does it mean? An isotropically means different in different directions. Polarizability you understand. Okay. What does it mean is the, for a molecule to show Raman spectrum, the requirement is that the molecule must have different uh, polarizability in different directions. This is a hydrogen molecule I am showing here. If I see, if I try to apply field, say this is hydrogen molecule here, if I apply field like this, there is certain kind of polarizability is there. Or if I apply field like this, we have different polarizability. That means the molecule can polarize to different extents. If that happens, then this molecule will show our Raman spectrum there. So that, that is the meaning of prerequisites there. Okay, let's move further. So we have seen that it's not that all radiation will interact with all random molecules. There are certain kind of prerequisites or prerequirements are there. Okay, so suppose the two can interact. What happens as a consequence of that? Let's look at this. So when the radiation and matter interact, the two interact and give me an outcome, the consequence of that happens to be a spectrum. Okay. So let us understand what is a spectrum. A spectrum basically is nothing but a plot of extent of absorption, that means uh, radiation absorbed, emitted or scattered uh, by the, as, as a function of the frequency wavelength of the radiation. Okay. So uh, let us look at this spectrum here. What we see is uh, this axis happens to be absorbance. This is the wavelength over there. What does it mean? What does it mean is uh, 
this is a, is a typical UV spectrum for a given molecule. What you see that at about 200, this is wavelength in nanometers there. So, at 200 nanometers, this does not absorb. As I move further, so around 209 or 210 nanometer, there is a very large absorption there. At 211, this is lesser and so on and so forth. At this wavelength, it comes to 0 and then again, there are certain things over there. So, this kind of a description, this kind of a plot of extent of absorption as a function of wavelength, this axis could be wavelength, frequency, energy or wave number and this always will be absorbance or intensity. So, this is what basically is a spectrum. Let us understand the meaning of a spectrum. How do I get a spectrum? Okay. Now, suppose I want to take a UV visible spectrum of a given molecule. What do I do? What do I do is, we will talk about that in detail in the next session over there. But for right now, to understand the meaning of a spectrum, let us understand what does it do. Now, suppose this is this is my sample here. That means this is some container in which my sample is there for which I want to take is a spectrum there. What do I do? I have some source of radiation there. Radiation is coming and I make this radiation to pass through this. Okay? And then after passing through this uh, my container uh, or the sample here, it comes out from here. So, I pass certain intensity and see what happens over here. Whether this is same as this or has it become lesser. If it has become lesser, then something has been absorbed there. Okay. So, what do I do? I pass radiation of different wavelengths. Say, I start from say 200, for this spectrum I am showing you here, uh, you start from about 200 nanometers, go to about 240 nanometers there. What does it mean? I take my sample, pass radiation of 200 nanometer and see what happens as a consequence of it. 201, 2, 3, I keep on changing my frequency or, or the wavelength of the radiation and passing through this and see what happens there and then whatever comes out, there are some kind of a mechanism there, there is a detector there to detect that. We try to work out what is the wavelength which is absorbed and to what extent it has been absorbed and that actually we plot in the terms of a graph there and that graph is referred to as a spectrum. Okay. More about it as we proceed further. Now, typically the kind of spectra we get, in case of atomic systems, there are two possibilities, there could be atomic absorption or emission there. In case of atomic spectra, the most important thing is the atomic spectra typically are line spectra. We can see it here, this is a, this is a emission spectrum of sodium and this is the absorption spectrum of sodium. So, what you see is uh, that this is typical Wibgeor. Okay. So, we have a rainbow kind of a thing here. So, out of that, if it, that means this basically representing the white light here. If I pass white light through a sample of sodium, sodium absorbs these two radiations there, a rest comes out over there. So, this is the absorption spectrum of sodium. On the other hand, if I take sodium, sodium vapors there and it is an excited state, when it comes down, this gives out the same radiation out over there. This is emission spectrum. That is a typical way of looking at the atomic spectra. Atomic spectra are relatively simpler there. So, emission spectrum is like this, absorption spectrum looks something like this, the two things are absorbed, rest all is coming out over here. Okay. So, the point here is that atomic absorption and emission are line spectra. But when it comes to molecules, there are different possibilities there. Say UV spectrum I showed you earlier, this is an absorption spectrum. We see what is absorbed to what extent it is absorbed. Then if you have IR spectrum, IR spectrum again is an absorption spectrum, but what we show is this axis happens to be wave number and this happens to be transmittance and we show signals like this, transmittance over there. So, that is that's a way of representing it. Essentially, this also is an absorption spectrum there. Third possibility is emission spectrum, fluorescent spectrum happens to be emission spectrum. This axis happens to be the wavelength and this axis happens to be the fluorescence intensity. To what extent, what kind of radiations are coming out, what is the intensity of that radiation which is coming out. Then if you look at this is a Raman spectrum, this is a scattering. We learned about it that Raman spectrum is a consequence of scattering of radiation. So, I mentioned about Rayleigh scattering, that is what it is and these are the these are signals over there which are the Raman spectrum part of it. And then we have got spectra which are NMR and ESR spectra which again are absorption spectra over there. Then the point I want to try to establish over here is I have showed you different kind of spectra just for sake of it. The 
uh, the atomic spectra whether absorption or emission they happen to be line spectra whereas the molecular spectra if you have seen I have been able to notice it they happen to be band spectra okay so that that's one typical thing over there and we will try to see uh, that in the when we continue with this in the next session we will try to sign, uh, establish why of it why the atomic spectra are line spectra and why molecular spectra are band spectra and what more we can learn about the nature of spectrum over there okay so i think it's time to conclude for today's session and uh, let's try to see what we have done today what we have done today is uh, basically we started by uh, making a statement that we are talking about the basic aspects of spectroscopy and we started by defining what is spectroscopy we define spectroscopy to be the study of interaction of radiation and matter thereafter we moved on to understanding the nature of electromagnetic radiation therein we took up two aspects of em radiation one what is the wave description of electromagnetic radiation we talked about that and then thereafter we took up different characteristics of radiation there em radiation that is uh, what is wavelength frequency wave number and so on and so forth then we came down to the particle description and then we try to understand how do we represent the energy of a radiation and then we said that is a very important formula that is e is equal to h nu is equal to hc by lambda is equal to hc nu bar which is a very very crucial formula for us having done that we moved on to the nature of uh, matter that is atoms and molecules and we talked about the quantization in case of atom that happens to be <coughs> so sorry <coughs> electronic excitation <coughs> electronic uh, quantization whereas in case of molecules we have got electronic energies vibration energies and rotation energies as quantized one then thereafter we came down to what are different ways in which radiation and matter can interact and we talked about absorption emission and scattering and towards the end we were talking about what happens as a consequence of that and prior to that we took took up the prerequisites for this kind of interaction to take place there and uh, from this we will continue in the next session thank you very much with this note thank you sir thank you so very much for giving us uh, this uh, session friends you are uh, requested uh, if you have uh, any queries or uh, feedback uh, then do write to us at info.cc@nic.in where you can post your feedback as well as your question too we are going to meet again very soon till then take care goodbye thank you sir thank, thank you, you.